afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome along to uh, the talk on Kubernetes. Um, I thought I'd start off quickly by asking, I, I'm guessing people have heard, heard of Kubernetes? Show hands. Used it, tried it out, had a little play. Anyone using it in production? Last talk I gave, there was someone that I said very bravely using it in production now, so um, yeah. I came across Kubernetes about um, 18 months ago. Uh, so I'm a consultant, and I, I came across a new technology much the way I came across any new technology, which was a customer said, we want to talk to you about, uh, about Kubernetes. And uh, sales looked around, and they said, you know about Docker, and this is kind of like Docker, so uh, you go and talk to them. At which point I went, okay, I best learn about this then. Um, and over the last 18 months, I've been trying to learn more about it, and I've picked up various things which hopefully are going to be interesting uh, and tell people a bit more about it. Um, you'll notice a lot of kind of sea-based imagery. If you're wondering why, the Docker and Kubernetes communities love their nautical metaphors. Uh, Kubernetes is Greek for steersman. So it's all about the kind of, so I figured it's a good opportunity for some nice pictures. Uh, very brief about me, um, I've been in information IT security now for a fair number of years. Uh, I'm a managing consultant at NCC Group. Um, I'm also a contributor at Security Stack Exchange. Has anyone ever heard of Stack Exchange, Security Stack Exchange? So it's super useful if you like security question and answers, like Stack Overflow, but for security. So if you ever have security questions and answers, feel free, go there, very handy. Uh, I'm also a contributing author at uh, the CIS Docker and Kubernetes standards. So one of the things I found out very early on when I started looking at this was there was really no good security information about Kubernetes at all when I started looking. This is a sort of middle of last year. So luckily a guy started a standard on this, uh, the CIS site, and I kind of chipped in and helped a bit, a bit with that. Um, so we at least got something to start with. So what are we gonna talk about? So that's the plan. Um, first thing we're gonna talk about is Kubernetes architecture. So what is this thing? How does it work? Um, I also find when I'm securing something or trying to break into something, it's a lot easier to understand how it works. So that's the idea. Start off with how does this work? Uh, we're talking about with deployment options. Again, one of the odd things I found about is there's so many different ways of deploying this stuff. You can deploy it on-premises, you can store it in a cloud. There's lots and lots of people who either sell you or give you an open source project for how to deploy this. So it's worth talking briefly about that. We're gonna talk about threat model. Um, threat model is really important, right? If no one attacks my security, it doesn't matter how bad my security is if no one's going to attack me. So working at who is going to attack me and how they might be going to do that is really important. And then we're gonna talk about security concerns, so how to fix this stuff. If that's about how to break it, then we're gonna talk about how to fix it, because obviously we need to fix this stuff afterwards. You can't just tell them it's broken, go away. Right, so what is it? Fair point to start off with. You go to the website, this is what they'll tell you. It is an open source system for automating, deploying, scaling, and managing containerized applications. It groups containers that make up an application into logical units for easy management and discovery, and oh, isn't that a mouthful? Um, basically, to me, what this is, is a way of allowing developers to roll out applications quickly and easily in a containerized, clustered, scalable way. So I want to roll something out where I can bring it, I can make it bigger quickly, I can roll out new versions quickly, I can handle my cluster nodes dying on me unexpectedly, and this system should manage all the complexity for me. I don't need to know anything about that. I just deploy the application and it handles the complexity, and that's the theory. What about it, where did it come from? This came out of Google in 2014. Um, some Google, in, Google had an internal project called Borg, and some Google engineers thought we'd like to have an open source version of this thing. So they came up with Kubernetes. Uh, so it doesn't share any code with Borg, but it's based on similar concepts. It's managed by a thing called the C Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, that is a kind of a conglomeration now of pretty much all the big players in cloud. So Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Red Hat, IBM, you know, you name it, they're probably involved in CNCF. And this is their flagship project. Um, Kubernetes itself got its first public release in 2015. That was its 1.0, so we're not talking like really old code here. And it's got really rapid development new major release every three months or so. One of the problems I've had with securing, talking about security on it, is they change everything. So you, you say, oh, my recommendation is this, then three months later your recommendation changes because there's a new version out. And also really rapid adoption. This is one of the things that surprised me when I started looking at this. So I started looking at it back, I say, not that long ago, 18 months, and um, there were already banks talking about using it. So in the UK is a bank called Monzo, uh, and they were tweeting about how they had rolled all their production infrastructure onto Kubernetes last year. Uh, the UK Home Office are another big user. They've gone to a lot of conferences and said they make use in production of Kubernetes. And also people like Walmart and Ocado, there have been various press releases saying that they're planning to roll out new systems onto Kubernetes. So this is something that we're starting to see quite big adoption of. People are making use of this stuff in the real world. It's not just like some sort of people thinking this is really cool and fuzzy. Real companies, real money being deployed on this stuff. So how does it work? Let's start off with a demo. because. 
why not? What could possibly go wrong? Uh, okay, so in Kubernetes land, everything is YAML. So yet another markup language if you've not come across it before. Basically, the idea is you get resources. So this is an application, and this basically describes an application. It describes what ports it uses, it describes what it's made up of, and it basically has all you need to know about the application in this one big YAML file. And what I should be able to do is at the moment if I do kubectl, this is the command you use basically to kind of keep an eye on your cluster. At the moment there's only one service which is the Kubernetes service. And that's the service that it runs on every cluster. But if I say kubectl create minus f example, and that's the YAML file I just looked at there. It goes away and it says, oh, I'm gonna create a whole lot of services for you. I'm gonna create you a Redis master, a Redis slave, and a front end. Okay, cool. So now if I do the same command I did before, and say get services, we can see that I've got a whole lot of services. I, I didn't have to do anything. I've, I've gone away and done that. Now it's put those on specific, into specific containers. I don't know what those containers are. I can find out, but I shouldn't need to know. This has just done it all for me. And it's exposed a port for me, 32316. So now I should be able to go to here and go to node one, which is the first node in my cluster, and go to 32316. Right, and that's my application. So that's the way I have an application deployed in what was that 10 seconds on a laptop. That's pretty cool. And I can say test. This is just a little, very little, silly little guest book thing. But the interesting thing potentially is I can go to another node in my cluster and I can say show me that. And it shows me my message from before and I can enter more messages. So what this has done is this has actually worked out how to route the traffic for me. I didn't know how to route the traffic inside the cluster. It's done it all for me. So another test. I can add that in. Uh, submit that. And I've got all these messages. So that. I think you can see that, to me, is that's why a lot of it's why it's interesting. So why are people interested in this thing? Because it's really easy to do that. And I can get an entire complex application up and running with a single YAML file and some containers. Okay. Don't need that because the demo worked. So a little bit of terminology. I talked about this, kind of mentioned these already. There's a lot of terminology in Kubernetes land. Containers um, are Docker containers. So these are essentially isolated app, um, Linux applications. All a container is really is a Linux application that gets bundled into a little package and gets isolated from the rest of the system. That's a container. Pods are closely grouped sets of containers. So you might want to put your containers like really close together so they'll share things like the same network space. And that's, you put those together in a pod. Services is what gets exposed to the outside world. So pods all live in the cluster, but the service is what the outside user sees. And nodes is just my nodes in my cluster. So there's some terminology in there that's kind of worth it. I'll mention pods lots because everything in Kubernetes land seems to be pods. How does it work? So it's done all that magic. It's gone away. It's created those things for me. It's created the application. But how did it actually do it? What components did it make use of? Because if we're going to break into this thing, we kind of want to know what we're going to attack. It looks a bit like this. In the middle of the cluster, you get this, the API server. This is the thing that you're interacting with. So when I sent that kubectl command, I sent that to the API server. This is the absolute heart of the cluster. Everything else talks to that. If you break into the API server, obviously that's gonna be really bad because you can tell the position in the middle there tells you it's a bit central. But Kubernetes is also, it's not a stateful service. The API server doesn't store state about how these things are deployed. What it does is it puts it into a key value store up the top. They use a product called etcd, which is just a simple key value store and basically it, Kubernetes will talk to the key value store and it'll say, store this for me, get this back for me, and there's a hierarchy of keys in there. From a security standpoint, again, if I can get in there, I can dump the entire cluster config. If I can dump the cluster config, I've got all the secrets that are in there, I've got all the configurations, I've got private keys, I've got all sorts of fun stuff, so it's bad. And then down the bottom, that's my master node, so the API server lives there. There'll be a number of worker nodes. In my cluster, I've got two worker nodes, but you can have like 200 worker nodes if you want. Each one of them has a kubelet on it, and the kubelet is a process that basically talks to the API server and it'll say, create me a container for whatever image. And that'll then instruct the container engine, which is usually Docker. So Docker lives under all this stuff at the moment. They're kind of probably gonna change that, but for the time being, it's Docker. Kubelet will tell Docker, it'll say, hey Docker, go and get me this image from whatever Docker repository and run it up. But the kubelet runs on every worker node and it has the authority to create new containers. So again, security standpoint, if I can play with that, I can muck about with the cluster. So those are the key ones. I kind of marked them in red. Networking is one other thing to mention because networking to me when I started learning about this turns out to be kind of weird. All my containers in there have their own flat network to talk to each other on. You can have nodes in different data centers, you can have nodes in different clouds, but Kubernetes will try and create a network that is a flat network across all of them. 
so that all the containers can talk to each other without needing to know anything about the underlying setup. They don't need to know that they're in different places. The weird part to me is, Kubernetes doesn't do this in, in and of itself. You put up a new cluster, the very first thing you'll have to do every single time is pick a networking plugin, which are all third-party plugins. There's a number of them that get kind of weird names like Weave, Calico, and Flannel. Um, and there's, a, there's, there's quite a few different ones. Um, but it doesn't do it itself, so you have to manage, you have to kind of like pick one and go with it. Um, and there's some security consequences to that. But, but it was kind of odd to me because it, it gives you this big flat network and then people just say, well, you can just talk to any of the container you want. That's great from a, a usability standpoint, but I'm sure you can imagine from a security standpoint, that may not be the best. One of the things I've noticed when I'm doing container assessments is people might think that internal network's trusted. Now, we all know about what assumptions of saying, oh, this network's trusted get you, they get you compromised. Um, so, yeah. And the other thing I mentioned about deployment options before, this is a little word cloud I did of all the different people who will give you a different way of deploying Kubernetes. There's a guy who maintains a spreadsheet of them, there's 67 different methods on his spreadsheet, and that's commercial products or open source projects. Um, there's things like full platform as a service from OpenShift, the Red Hat OpenShift, uh, which is, they'll do a lot of stuff for you. They like to layer a holder of their own products on top of Kubernetes, all the way down to things that are basically bash scripts. Um, they just, you know, run the components and configure them. So there's a huge variety of options. And when I've been looking at this, the thing that I found the most important thing is the, import, is, is the importance of secure defaults. Because what I've found is that each one of these options, each one of these deployment options makes its own choices about how to secure the cluster, what options to turn on, what option not to turn on. And some of them make what I would call some really surprising choices uh, about what not to bother securing. Um, so I've looked at various ones and I've filed bugs saying, did you really mean you know, to configure that in that fashion because it could, could lead you to this problem? So all the problems I'm gonna talk about as we go through this presentation, I've seen these all in live default configurations of fairly large services. This isn't just theoretical stuff. I've actually, there's one I've got kind of a bug bounty or bug report in with at the moment. I'm trying to get them to fix it because it's uh, pretty much got all these problems. But let's talk about threat model, right? So threat model, who is going to attack my cluster? How are they going to attack my cluster? Because that tells us what we need to do in terms of trying to break into it and try to secure it. We've got external attackers. You put something on the internet, someone's gonna try and break into it. That's just the way it works. Um, so on the internet, people will try and break into it from that. If you deploy Kubernetes onto your internal WAN, then anyone who can get on the internal WAN can try and attack your cluster, right? They can get to, if they can get to it over the network, they can try and break into it. Pen testers will be trying to break into it, pretty much guaranteed. Um, attackers with access to a single container. So if an attacker manages to break one, say you've got 10 applications deployed in your cluster, uh, and you've got a number of different web apps, and one of them's got a security bug in it. An attacker might be able to compromise that one container. So an attack scenario is, how easy is it for me to go from compromising one container to compromising the whole cluster? And this is the one where I've run into some problems when I've been discussing this with Kubernetes people, because a lot of them don't see that as a valid threat. They don't consider that as part of their threat model. Their view of the world is, if you, the cluster is the security boundary. Once you're in the cluster, we don't care. Personally, I don't think that's a great idea. Um, from my experience of security, that's not a great plan, but that is what they do, and that's one of the problems I've had in terms of getting people to change their minds about how to deploy things. And the other one is, Kubernetes allows you to have different users, and you can have different applications running in a cluster. So the, the chance of a malicious user turns up. Either a user loses their credentials, or you get someone who wants to do something on a cluster they shouldn't be allowed to do, but is frustrated that they can't do it. And so what could a bad user do? That's my other attack model. So what we'll do is we'll go through each one of these. Let's talk about external attackers first. Um, I'm a tester. The very first thing I do if someone gives me a network service is I port scan it. Um, it's the first point. What, what, can I, what have I got to play with here? What have I got that's potential? And Kubernetes is great because you've got lots of potential. Um, we've got 2379, which is ETCD, we talked about before. We've got 4194, we've got this one here, I kind of mentioned it as that. People can't make up their mind what port to put it on. So it could be 6443, 6, 8443, just 443. That's the API server. The next one is a really good pointer that it's not good if you see it because it's called the insecure API server. That's actually the technical, that's what they call it in Kubernetes land, insecure API server, and yet people will enable it sometimes. 10.250 and 10.255 are the kubelet, and we'll talk about more of those, and various pl network plugins. So network plugins, like I said, you don't know which one you're gonna get. They sometimes have their own ports. Some of them use BGP. So one of them will deploy BGP on an internal, to manage the, the networking of the cluster. So that's got its own attack surface, obviously. Some of them will run their own ETCD instances, uh, things like 4001, you'll see that. But basically, you see a variety of stuff there. So let's talk about how we, how we can break into some of those. We'll start off with C-Advisor. 
So C Advisor is pretty much on every cluster by default I've seen. You'll always see it there. Um, and if you, basically it's an HTTP service, it's unauthenticated. Indeed, there is no option to make it authenticated. There's no flag you can set to put authentication onto it, and it's unencrypted. So if you see this on a cluster, you're gonna get this. It doesn't give you like complete compromise, but it gives you some quite nice information. If I'm a pen tester, um, it gives me some interesting information. So if I go in here, uh, it'll do things like, it'll tell me all the pods I've got running. So that's all the different containers I've got running on my cluster. That's kind of useful information. It'll tell me what version of Docker I'm running. Well, if it's a really old version, maybe I can find an exploit. It tells me the kernel version. It tells me the operating system version. It tells me the directories things are deployed to. So if I've got some means of executing code or pulling back contents of files, I get some directories. And also down the bottom, it tells me all the different versions of the different components that I'm running. So whilst that's not game over, nor is it really great, nor, nor should that be exposed, but that's pretty much on every cluster I've looked at. If you can get to the port, it's gonna be unauthenticated, um, and you can do that too. So that's kind of interesting. That worked. Okay, attacking the kubelet. So the kubelet's got two ports. It's got read-only and it's got read-write. Um, if we look at read-only, it, it's got various endpoints, and one of them is slash pods. So it only has a couple of things. It's basically the idea of the read-only port. It's there for statistic services. Lots of people want like a nice dashboard that says how your cluster is getting on. So this thing is designed to provide the input to that. Um, it's unauthenticated by default, and there is no option to make it authenticated, and it's unencrypted. So not great. This again chucks out a load of information in a nice JSON format. But the, the probably the most interesting part, if you're attacking it, is it, this, this particular node has got the API server running on it. And what it does is it tells you all the command line options. Everything in Kubernetes land is a command line option, literally everything. So if you get this, you get all sorts of fun stuff like what port we're running on, what's the, what's the key file for the private key for the PKI that's, that's securing it? it? Tells you the names. It's not gonna get you the compromise, but if I'm an attacker and I'm a pen tester, I'm a really happy pen tester right now, because I've got this great start, starting point that tells me all this kind of, what authorization mode am I using, what's my you know, certificate name, all that sort of fun stuff. And that, that, that's fun, um, but it's not, it's not compromise fun. Um, if you get the read-write port, uh, then this is on SSL, although it's self-signed. Uh, so let's add our exception, as we always do. You can do things like dump out all the logs. So that's kind of handy. That lets me dump all the logs from the containers on the thing, which is that's useful. But again, it's not compromised. It's not what we want. If you get the read-write port, so you get port 10250, which is what this is on, you're probably, and you can get to it without authentication. Earlier versions, so one of the things I said is Kubernetes keeps changing. If you go back to, I, I talk about earlier versions, but I mean like six months ago. I'm not talking like years and years ago. People are running this stuff. Earlier versions didn't have authentication for the read-write port. So if you could get to it at a network level, you were going to be able to, to, to execute any commands you wanted. Um, newer versions do have that. I still have seen clusters that expose it, definitely internally, if not externally. What you can do here, and I'm gonna copy-paste this command because I can never get it right when I'm trying to type it. Uh, where are we? Here. All of these things are HTTP APIs, which is really useful because it means that you can just use curl. Uh, so if we clear. So what I've got is a command here which basically says, go and do a post to the Kubelet API for me. Uh, there's the port. And then basically here's the, the, the pod I need to, to post at to tell it to go and do it for. Now I got that list because I got that from the read-write read port. So I know I can easily find this stuff. And then you do all the way through here. And then at the end you tell it what command you want it to run. Uh, and that could be anything you like, frankly. Uh, and, and, it, and so if I do this, that file I'm trying to retrieve essentially is a file that the administrator uses to authenticate to the cluster. And drug go to demos being happy, yeah, there we go. And there's my client key data, there's my name, I'm the Kubernetes admin, uh, and, and everything else. And you can do, and you can also, if you're interested, you can do things like, where am I? Oh, I'm root, so down there. Tells me who I am, I'm root. So you're basically executing as root inside a container at that point. So if they haven't authenticated the Kubelet API uh, and you can get read write on it, for each node that's running on that's game over, uh, that's I'm going to compromise every container running on this, on this node. It's not good news. So that one's bad. If you see that one, or if you're an attacker, it's really good. If you're, if you're a defender, it's really not so good. Um, so Kubelets are bad. And my demos work, don't need those. Let's talk about malicious containers, right? So I've been a pen tester for quite a long time. It's not uncommon that on a web application you might get some kind of minor command execution. Like you can get onto, you can, you can execute commands, maybe you can upload a shell, maybe you can get blind command execution, maybe you can get SSRF, right? So all these things are HTTP APIs. 
So if I can make the server execute commands on my behalf, what can I do to the APIs there? Because it's all HTTP. So it gets you an increased attack surface. Now I've got a container, so we're gonna have a guy who's got a container, he's got that far, but can he get the whole cluster? You've got access to the container file system, right? So I've got access to the container that I've compromised, fine. That shouldn't be, there shouldn't be that much in there, just some binaries and whatever it needed to run. I've got that internal network position. So now I'm on that internal cluster network, and like I said, a lot of people who make these systems don't regard that as being part of their threat model. So once you're in, they've got less, a lot less protection. It's easier for you to get further on. And obviously, the way, the way kernel, kernels, Linux containers work, you can attack a shared kernel. All containers on a node run against one single Linux kernel. If there's a kernel vulnerability, you can try and use that to escalate out to get access to the node. So let's talk about, this was really fun. Service account tokens are fun. Um, so in Kubernetes land, uh, every container, when it's launched, gets a series of actions applied to it by the API server. Basically, a series of things it does to set the container up. And one of these copies a service token into the container, so essentially mounts a file inside the container. And the goal of that token is to allow the container to talk to the API server. So it says, here isn't a thing for you, little Mr. Application, you can now talk to the API server using this token. Until very recently, those tokens were all cluster admin tokens. Um, so basically, if you, could, if you could execute against one, you could do anything the cluster admin could do, which is kind of not good. Uh, as an example, if I do kubectl create, I might say, I've got a container called bad container, because, you know, um, all right, so I've now created my little bad container. This is just to simulate my compromised container. And I can do kubectl exec minus it bad container. Okay, so that's me now. I'm now in my, uh, right, I'm now inside the container network. I'm on my, running on my little bad container. Now, I'd like to say that there was some super leap ninja uh, thing I had to do at this point to get cluster admin, but in reality, all I did was I downloaded the kubectl binary, um, and then I run it, and it works. And I'm now cluster admin. I can do anything I want. And the cool thing about that is, is what it does is, um, oops, what it does is, is Kubernetes very handily, when you start a container up, one of the other things it does, it populates a whole lot of environment variables so that you know where to find things. Because obviously the pods can get started up and turned down and all that sort of stuff, so you can't reliably have IP addresses. So it sets a whole of environment variables, and one of them is it tells it where to find the API server. And then the kubectl will always look for a token in the fixed location, the, valid, the, you know, the, the default location. So basically, as long as that token's in place, and you download kubectl, you get to be cluster admin, which is fantastic if you're an attacker. Not so great if you're a defender. This actually stung the B-side San Francisco. They ran a CTF, and they thought they'd be really cool, and they'd run it inside Kubernetes. Uh, and what happened to them was the very, one of the guys popped the first flag, got shell on the first attack, then, hang on, this is a Kubernetes cluster. Got kubectl, thank you very much, my cluster. Took out all the other flags. Really easy CTF. And so the guys that run B-side um, San Francisco, they didn't realize that, and to be fair, uh, this isn't, whilst if you talk to enough Kubernetes people, they will, this is known, it's not like a kind of super secret, nor is it massively well publicized that that's the case. So, yeah. Uh, and it lives in, where was it lives? It lives in var run secrets. And basically that's the service account. Uh, so you can just cut out the token, it's just a text file. And if you present that token to an API server, it basically says yes, you've got whatever rights. In this case, in this case you are cluster admin, which is great. So service account tokens, yeah, dangerous things. I'm kind of surprised, this is a default choice. This really surprised me because I'm like, this, okay, yeah, I can see why you might need it, but not by default. Um, yeah, that didn't work. API server attacks. Uh, before I mentioned, there's obviously the, um, the insecure API, uh, uh, insecure API server. I do know at least one cloud service provider who runs Kubernetes who still has this available from the internal cluster network. So if you're in the cluster network, this is available. This one is just as easy as compromise. So you just do kubectl, minus s, http, tell it where to go. Actually, probably, I'd probably use an environment variable for this. But. Yeah, so same thing. If you can get to the insecure API server, it's pretty much game over. Just tell kubectl where to go. So just tell it what the endpoint is. IP address, port number, and it knows the semantics and it can work from there. So if you get the insecure API server, that's game over too. Uh, ETCD. So talk about, mentioned ETCD. Uh, if you get access to ETCD, then obviously that's game over as well because it's got the full container config, uh, full cluster config. It's got all the different things. Uh, it's similar, so I'm gonna get the command for this one because I never remember this one. There we go. 
So basically, it used to be, it was a nice HTTP API and you could use curl and all that stuff, but they've gone to this binary format now, which is kind of annoying. Uh, I'm still inside my bad container. Uh, let's go back to root so I can see this easier. And then do what that's done is that just dumps, that, just, that command just says go and dump that, that the, the config out to a file. Um, so it's called testdb. And then it's in this format called boltdb, which isn't a format I've ever come across before, but uh, you can just do bolt browser. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, that's the config of the cluster. So as you can see, there's some kind of binary nonsense in there because it's serialized gRPC these days. But there's enough text in there that you can you know, either deserialize it if you really want everything, or you can just get all the various uh, keys and tokens that are living in there. Um, yeah, so if you can get ACD, that's kind of interesting. I'll talk about this, because the authentication for it's kind of interesting, so I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, attacking ETCD is bad as well. And again, it's game over because it's a full cluster config. And the OS kernel, like I said, I mean, you, you can try and, uh, I won't go too much, I'm gonna, not just, it depends on the kernel version you're running as to how easy that's gonna be. You can run something like Am I Contained? This is a really useful tool if you're doing container testing. Um, basically, it's a one-liner, and you just basically tells you some stuff about how the, how the container is configured and how, what containment options you've got set. So if you're doing container assessments, am I contained is a really handy. You can do it all manually with proc if you feel like it, but it tells you what capability you've got and various other bits and pieces, whether user namespaces are, are in use. So how easy that's gonna be depends on what version of the kernel you're gonna be using. But it's a kind of a cool technique anyway. Okay. So talk, let's talk about malicious users, right? So we've got a big cluster. We might have lots of users, and we might not want them all to be cluster admins. So obviously we're gonna have to try and restrict them and lock them down from doing stuff. The problem is, uh, it, you have to give people, if they're users, kubectl access, basically. Because all interaction is done through that. I saw another presentation, and they were talking about the fact that um, they wanted to not give their developers SSH access into the cluster. So they said, oh, we'll just have them use kubectl. Well, you've seen, I can do kubectl exec. It is SSH access. It's everything access. You can execute commands with kubectl. You can spin up containers, delete containers, SSH into containers, anything you want to do with containers. kubectl is a really great program. But if you give people access to that, they can do quite a bit. Um, and one of the problems with some containers is there's an idea in container land of a thing called privileged. And if you've read any Docker security guidelines, it's basically the first thing it'll say is do not allow privileged containers. A privileged container is basically turn off all the security. Just turn it all off. Don't isolate me from the node. I want access to the underlying stuff. Right? Um, now, you can pass an option if it's not locked down called privileged is true. Um, and the other thing you can do is you can mount stuff in from the host if you want to, by default. Uh, and you can basically mount, so I can mount in from the host, I can mount in the root file system into a directory. Now you can imagine that's probably gonna be bad. The interesting thing for me when I was looking at this is um, there's an option that you can set on the API server which is allow privilege true or false. Every single cluster I've looked at says true. And the reason for that is things like the network plugins need it, so they default to allowing it which is a bit of a problem because it means you can do something, well, a bit like this. So I can just do kubectl create minus f priv pod. It creates priv pod and then I can just do cube. So that's me created my privileged pod and I can do kubectl exec minus it. That's me inside my privileged pod. And if I go into the node directory, that's the root file system of the node, right? And if I go into etc, all the files are there. And if I say, who am I? It says I'm root. So as far as that node is concerned, I'm root. If I want to edit a file, I'm editing at UID zero, I'm root. It'll let me edit shadow, SSHD config, anything you like. It's game over for that host. So if you can do privileged containers, that's not good news. Privileged containers are very dangerous. Should not be allowed. Uh, and actually, well, yeah, access to nodes is really bad because basically there's keys in there that allow it to communicate, each node to communicate with the cluster master. So they're dangerous. So key security considerations. I've just shown you the various ways that if it's configured wrong, this stuff gets broken really easily. How do you configure it so that that doesn't happen? Turn off the insecure port. Clue is in the name. There's no reason for allowing it. If you absolutely have to have it, bind it to localhost. I've seen some people bind it to localhost, which is less bad. It's still not like completely safe, but it's all less bad than allowing it to be bound to any other interface. API server authentication. Everything should be authenticated. Kubernetes authentication is a bit weird. Uh, it used to be they used HTTP basic auth or token auth, and those are both static files stored on the API server if you wanted to, and in the clear, obviously the creds are all in the clear, which is not great. 
If you wanted to change anything, add a user, remove a user, you had to go in, SSH into it, edit the file, resave it, and then reload the service. That was the only way to change your user. So that's not really a great idea. Most people will say don't do that anymore. Um, instead, you use client certificates. So basically, you get a certificate authority you can get with Kubernetes, and each user gets a client certificate created for them, and so information about their identity gets encoded into the certificate. There is, however, one thing to watch with that, which is there's no certificate revocation concept inside Kubernetes right now. So if your user loses their certificate, you either reissue all the certificates, or you wait for it to expire. Those are your only two choices. There are external authentication options, uh, things like webhook options, so you can, you can set up a webhook and do something else yourself, but within Kubernetes, that's pretty much it. Certificate, client certificates are probably the best of a bad bunch. Authorization. So at the moment, any older clusters, they tend to just make you cluster admin, so they just say, if you're in, you're in, we're not gonna bother with authorization. Newer versions last say, four or five months, you start to see RBAC come along, role-based authentication. That's obviously a great improvement, but you do have to make sure you apply it. Um, to give you, a, it can get a little bit complex. I'll give an example. Uh, uh, cluster roles. That's the basic cluster roles that come with the cluster without you adding any. So you do have to watch, there's a bit of complexity in there. It's not like the super simplest thing in the world to, to, to manage. Um, the other thing that, that it's important to note that I think it caused people a lot of problems when they start rolling this stuff out in production is there's no concept in Kubernetes of a user database. Kubernetes doesn't know about, it doesn't like store a database of all its users. What it basically does is it relies on the certificate that's presented to it to tell it what the identity of a user is. So if you say to a Kubernetes admin, give me a list of all your users, he'll go, eh, don't know. Don't know what my users are. It's whatever the CA administrator set up. Control access to the kubelet. No, uh, no, no anonymous auth. Um, turn off the read-only port. These things are all options. That's the good thing is they can all be turned off. The good thing about it now is you pretty much can secure this stuff, it, but it, it, six months ago, these options, some of them didn't exist. Now they do. Turn it off. Turn off C advisor. Turn off anonymous authentication. It's definitely the way to go. Uh, control access to ETCD. Um, the interesting thing about ETCD is the way it authenticates is it basically, you tell it when you launch it, this is your trusted certificate authority. And it will say, any certificate from that certificate authority, I trust. And it will give full access because it doesn't really have an authorization concept when used with Kubernetes. So if you can get a certificate for any certificate that was issued by that certificate authority, you can get access to ECD. So if you only use one CA, say you've issued all your users client certificates so they can do their stuff and they can get a network level TCD, they can point at their certificate at ECD and say, hey, I'm trusted. Can I have the database to the cluster, please? And it'll give it them, which is not great. So that needs careful thought as to how you handle that. Other things to think about. Um, obviously, allowing people to run privileged pods is very dangerous. You can set a pod security policy. So you can basically say, these are all the things that are allowed to be done. You should only allow these, and you should restrict users in what they do. I don't think there's any good way to secure a cluster without doing that. So pod security policy is kind of an, a requirement. It's fairly new, but it, it's it's, I think it's in stable now. Maybe still in beta, but it's either beta or stable. Security context, um, you can tell it you can allow it to, you can lock down a container in terms of what it can actually do, you can take capabilities off it, you can take other rights off it, you can apply SE Linux policies to it. Anyone who's done SE Linux policies knows that's not super simple, but it's worth looking at if you're rolling this out in production. Network policy, this is fairly new, this came out 1.7 into release, um, but this essentially solves the problem of the flat network. So where before clusters would tend to be flat networks, it's now at least possible to say, this container can only access these other containers on these ports which is absolutely a requirement, I think, if you're gonna have a secure cluster. You're basically gonna have to use pod security policy and network policy, otherwise it's very difficult to lock this stuff down properly. Resources, um, a couple of resources. There's a CIS guide. CIS very, very, very annoyingly recently went to this thing where you have to go to this page, give them some information, hit send, and then keep the same browser open until they send you a link and then put the link into the same browser. I don't know why, I just warning you in advance because I found it really annoying when they started doing that. But you can get the benchmark, it's free. It doesn't actually cost you anything apart from a fake email address you make up. Um, and also I've started doing a little tool to try to analyze some of this stuff. So I've actually done a, a, very briefly I did a, well, actually I could have stayed in there, couldn't I? Uh, so basically what that does is basically get all the CIS checks, which are all the different command line switches. And basically for each cluster, it just says, have you passed or have you failed? And what was the evidence for why I think that's the case? Uh, and down the bottom, I've started doing some authentication, some sort of vulnerability checks here. So things like, do you have external authenticated access to Kubelet? 
Do you allow internal access to Kubelet? Is the API port exposed? All this sort of stuff. Just kind of basic checks. And one of the problems I run into is, like I said, the 67 different ways of deploying this. It turns out it's really hard to code something that handles all 67 different methods. So I've kind of covered the basic ones, but if you use an obscure one, this probably won't work brilliantly. That said, if anyone wants to put any issues of pull requests, if you like writing Ruby, and who doesn't, um, then it's written in Ruby, and it really should be fairly easy to, to modify. Uh, but yeah, that's another resource. Conclusion. So I think what I'd say about Kubernetes is uh, it's a really cool product. And older versions of it were really not very secure at all. Um, newer versions, you can secure them, but they, they might not be secure by default. So now it's at least possible to configure in a secure fashion, but you're going to have to put some effort into it in all likelihood. Um, the default security options, I think, are super important. Ultimately, this is quite a complex product. Once you've got it out running in production, I don't think a lot of people are going to make major changes to it. So try and get things like pod security policy and network policy sorted out before you go into production, not afterwards. Uh, and always think about your threat model and attack surface. So if you're worried about compromised containers, make sure that the person you're getting the software from is worried about compromised containers. Because uh, if they're not, you're going to have a bad time. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, if you, you get anything from Kubernetes 1.5 or earlier, they still have to have old, old releases. If you get like 1.5 or earlier, they will just be vulnerable because they all were really awful. Um, apart from that, I don't think so. I've seen Docker ones, but I haven't seen anything for Kubernetes yet. Uh, I'll call it be too hard to do. But yeah, but basically, if you look, I'd look for older ones. Look for anything like Kubernetes 1.5 or earlier is likely to have most or all of these problems. Um, and even later ones, some of them have them. But. They don't, I don't think I've ever seen any, no one's done a, I suppose it's a project, I could, if I was doing like a project in Kubernetes, uh, um, that'd be worth doing, but no, I, I'm not aware, not aware of one yet for, for, for learning to test it. Um, no, it's not so far anyway. Any other questions? I do not have any, infra I've not done any work with the Home Office regarding their Kubernetes deployments. I would sincerely hope that the UK Home Office have had appropriate assessments of any things before they deploy into production, but I'm not, I don't have any kind of, they don't, whilst they, they will, they've, they've gone public to conferences and said, we use this stuff, they haven't said that these are our configs. So I, I, I'm not in a position to be able to say, oh, look, they do, you did or didn't do whatever. Uh, I do hope that, I do hope them and I hope Monzo, who are a bank, have been using it for a while, I hope both of them have like thought through all this stuff and like sorted it all out, I'm sure they would. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, if I was picking, if you go in cloud hosted, uh, either Google, Google's own version of it, which is GKE, Google Container Engine, uh, is pretty good because Google kind of wrote it. Uh, the other one that's good is OpenShift, Red Hat OpenShift. Um, so Red Hat OpenShift is like a, their PaaS, and it's, it's got a whole lot of stuff that goes ba based on Kubernetes. That's the one, honestly, we're seeing more of in terms of deployments, and it's best. A lot of the security stuff in Kubernetes, they have written it first into their own product, and then they pushed it back upstream into Kubernetes. So if I was, if I, if someone said make, if it made me pick, I'd say Red Hat OpenShift would be the one I would pick. Anyone else? No, excellent. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>